the, probably the most visited museum in Amsterdam. Um, they have a, a, a print collection of 700,000 prints, some of which you see on the right here, and they want them annotated, right? So they want to have uh, in information about the height and the size and the colors, but they also want to know what's on it. And they don't just want to know that there's anything on it, they want to have very specific information. So, for example, a print like this. Does anybody know what is depicted here? A flower, but do we know what kind of flower this is? <coughs> it's, so it's, it's an iris, apparently. So this is already, this is very specific information. I have no idea, I don't know, I know nothing of flowers. Um, but there are flower people that know this, that can instantly recognize this. So there's another one, uh, anyone know what this is? That's the last quiz uh, question, so after that you're free. This is a castle. Does anyone know which castle this is? Of course you don't, because I had no idea either. This is, <laughs> this is Castle Wijk bij Duurstede. It's a very specific castle. But there are people in the Netherlands, the, the castle geeks, let's call them, and they know these castles. They know, ah, these, these towers, this is the Castle Wijk bij Duurstede, even though it may, may have collapsed uh, years and years ago. Um, and what we want to do, basically, is see if we can get this information. Now, uh, if we want to have uh, professional experts annotate these prints. We all know that this, uh, this uh, is a colossal effort. Uh, 700,000 prints, even with a lot of professional annotators that uh, are uh, employed by Rijksmuseum, this will take a long, long time and they might not even get there. Right, so the, the, the Print on Online project estimates that uh, 11 professional catalogers will not even get uh, close to a quarter of uh, annotating all these prints. And even worse, the, uh, the Rijksmuseum people have no idea what kind of castle this is, right? So they know about art, but they don't know about castle, or they don't know about flowers, or birds, or whatever. So the specific expertise that might be needed to get really uh, high quality and very specific knowledge specific uh, data is not, uh, not present in these uh, experts. So let's say professional annotation might not work here. So a natural idea, as we heard it in the previous talk, is crowdsourcing. Right, so crowdsourcing is in general a good idea to get lots and lots of tags for, uh, so for the weirdest things, but usually you lack a certain knowledge specificity. Right, uh, uh, so the general crowd, uh, the, the, uh, the average Joe, he can annotate this with uh, flower or castle, like you can, but they can't say this is like a Bedouin state or a, or a lily, right? Or uh, sorry, uh, iris. Um, so what we want is, what the people from Rijks Museum want is exactly this specific information. So they don't want a castle, they want back by Duurstede. And they don't want flower, but they want iris, or they want even more weirder information. So they want people that know about Japanese prints, that if there's a frog on there, it has a specific meaning. Right, so they want not only this, high, this sort of specific, specific information, but they also want high quality uh, uh, tags. They don't want to go through all the junk uh, uh, tags and the people that uh, sort of abuse uh, the, the uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk and the, just wade through all this, uh, the, the sort of false tags. And what they also want, because they have these 700,000 uh, prints, is that they want to have people uh, on board for a longer, ti uh, longer time. So not just a project where the people do crowdsourcing and then just go to the next crowdsourcing hype. Uh. Okay. So this is not just observed in this in Rijk Museum use case, but in general, there are a number of uh, projects where we have observed that there is within, especially within cultural heritage uh, institutions, a growing demand for these tasks that require a, sp a, a, sp a specific level of knowledge, right? And that might either be that the task itself is too hard, uh, is, is very hard, or they want to have these uh, images annotated with specific uh, quality tags, right? So uh, not on the natural level, castle, but on the specific level, like the Duurstede castle. So and the other thing is that uh, so it's going more towards quality. So crowdsourcing has proven itself to be very valuable, but in the end you are often left with lots and lots of tags, whereas the museum people specifically are very much interested in a few very good tags. Right? So our idea, and sort of it's, uh, we have been testing this idea for uh, a while now, is to sort of move to, to, to go to the next step in crowdsourcing. That's what this precision paper is about. So we, so we thought of the term niche sourcing, which is a new term, but not a, maybe a new concept. And we think, so crowdsourcing is, the, uh, is, is a sort of, it, we know what it yields, but we want to go for this high level uh, knowledge specific knowledge uh, tags and uh, uh, annotations. Right, so in, in niche sourcing, what you do rather than 
send tasks to the faceless crowd is you send it to specific groups of amateur experts. And these groups, so, so we don't, didn't completely define them, but what we know about these groups is that they have some shared characteristics. And that they have some intrinsic motivation to the task. So they are either you know, the castle geeks or the, 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 the people that know about flowers, or they are the people that have another relation to the task. Uh, but we know that even though we don't know the, the individuals in this group, we know that the, group, the people in this group have uh, shared characteristics. Right, so uh, currently we are now doing a, uh, uh, an experiment or setting up a system where we are now building a knee sourcing application for this uh, use case that I, uh, I showed earlier. So this is the accurator, uh, the accurator uh, um, sort of tool in which exactly these Rex Museum prints will be uh, distributed amongst the known niches. So uh, the niches that have been identified are, well, you can hardly see it, but there are these windmill experts, people that know about Dutch windmills. And these are amateurs, right? They don't get paid for it, but they are really passionate about windmills. So you can give them a, a couple of, uh, of um, uh, yeah, images and they will be happy to take it. Right? And we have maritime domain experts, we have people that know about birds, we have people that know about uh, flowers. Uh, and what you can do is use either the uh, tags that are provided by experts, right? so people from the Rex Museum, or you can use the tags that are delivered by the crowdsourcing people. So these are the tags on the natural level. So we know it's a castle, we don't know which castle, but at least we know we have to send it to the castle people. Right? And then what happens is that these, uh, these uh, uh, sort of higher quality, more knowledge specific tags are aggregated. We have to do some quality uh, assurance there and then uh, we have these uh, sort of specific windmill and specific boat uh, tags. So this is currently being set up and will be evaluated and you'll probably hear, hear more about it uh, maybe in, in two years. Okay, so um, I'll go quickly through the, so the ideas. What, when, as an institution, when you have a task, when do you have to do crowdsourcing and when you have to do niche sourcing? So it's, it's more explained in more detail in the, in the paper, but so first, the first dimension that we think is important is the, the type of atomic task. So this is the thing that you have to give to an individual uh, annotator. So crowdsourcing works very well for very simple atomic tags, things that people can do, right, that have no knowledge, background knowledge at all. Uh, so this is finding a, a dark spot in an image or it's uh, annotating on this natural level. But niche sourcing is for tasks that require this more specific knowledge or that require more effort, right? So if there's a lot of effort, uh, crowdsourcing doesn't work in general because people have to spend a lot of time, so you have to start paying them and start sort of motivating them through more and more badges, etc. Uh, with niche sourcing, these people, uh, the, 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 you know, the castle geeks, they are willing to spend more effort uh, per uh, task. So that's one dimension. The other one is quality versus quantity. So I've already talked about, it, uh, talked about this a bit, uh, where the success of crowdsourcing is lies in quantity. That's undeniably true, right? These 700,000 prints could be probably easily be annotated in a, in a crowdsourcing experiment. Um, but the quality of the, the text is very questionable. And especially culture heritage people are really, really concerned about quality. So they really don't like wrong tags. So the intrinsic sort of motivation and the courtesy that exists within these niche groups that have a relation to the task, uh, we expect will lead to higher quality, um, higher quality tags or higher quality annotations that require less effort from the experts to uh, correct, uh, et cetera. So this is an, uh, this is an uh, uh, assumption that we will test in, uh, in, uh, in upcoming uh, experiments. Okay, uh, I'm missing one slide here. <laughs> but uh, so the third one is about motivation, right? So by sending, uh, if you send uh, the motivation, well, I'll, I'll wait with this slide because you're all wondering what be a uh, green, green superhero. But uh, so the, the third one is about motivation. So people that are, have a natural relation to the task are more motivated to, uh, to uh, perform that task. And so you have to do, so let's say less careful planning and with badges and payments and uh, and uh, and competition, uh, because you can rely on the fact that people are willing, more willing to uh, to perform these tasks. Okay, so on to the regreening superhero use case, which is a is a second a second use case that sort of shows how diverse this idea of niche sourcing is. So here um, we have a, a, a task where um, we have a, lo a lot of documents from the Sahel area. Uh, and th those documents are about uh, rainfall, right? pluvial records. 
And what will be really helpful for uh, regreening efforts is if we know how much rain fell on which pot in the, in the last couple of years. Right, so this is th these things are all handwritten by this uh, guy you see here on the top right. These are from uh, uh, Mali, I think. Um, and uh, one of our students has made an application that uh, is a digitization application for these documents. And he specifically, so this is a very boring task, right? So it's really looking at numbers and then digitizing them and putting them in tables. Uh, so what his sort of niche sourcing uh, solution is, is to distribute these tasks to a specific group, which is the African diaspora. So these are people uh, that have uh, emigrated from Africa, from the region that is, uh, in which the, uh, this is important, to, uh, let's say, Western or Northern countries, and now have access to uh, Facebook and uh, um, applications, uh, computational power, and they are very, very willing to, uh, to uh, help out here. So this is sort of by, by targeting this group, you don't have to spend ages on um, doing badges and, and the payment. You just have people that are extremely willing and have background knowledge that can help with determining which villages are written down, even if it's hardly readable. OK. So uh, final slide. Um, knee sourcing challenges. So we think it's a good idea. We're currently testing it. We're evaluating this. Um, one thing that we know is we, an issue is, of course, sometimes you don't have these niches, right? So then you're out of luck and you have to go to crowdsourcing or pay people. Uh, the not, another one is how do you distribute tasks? How do you at, can you automatically determine which tasks should be distributed to which niches? Um, and another one is how can we use the intrinsic links and the social connections that exist within these niches? Uh, that are either uh, that either manifest themselves through social links in social me uh, social uh, networks, or through people-to-people -people links. How can we use these links to do task distribution and also uh, to motivate people further by reputation or <coughs> going to the altruism, uh, going for the altruism uh, uh, argument? Okay, that's it. If you want to know more about the regreening, click here on the right. Left. If you want to know more about uh, <laughs> boats, click on the right. If you want questions, click on the uh, thing before asking them. <laughs>